Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Barbara DePietro. I'm the Senior Director of Policy at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and I'll be acting as a moderator for today's webinar entitled Hospital Community Benefit Funding, Potential Resources to Meet the Needs of Homeless Populations. This is a production of the National HCH Council, supported by HRSA and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. Please note this session is being recorded. It's a one-hour presentation. The last 10 or 15 minutes will reserve for some question and answer. If you have a question, please put it in the pr presentation slide. Um, underneath that, there is a chat box for participant questions and technical issues. If you can't hear something or if something is going wrong or if you have a question, all of that goes in that presenter chat box underneath the presentation slides. Uh, we'll save those for the end and we'll include those in the question and answer. Uh, if you're having any technical issues and you're not getting what you need here in that, on that box, please contact the Council's office at 615-226-2292 and speak with Hannah. The PowerPoint presentation and the recording of this webinar will be posted on our website, hopefully within a few days, and the email will be uh, sent to anyone who had registered for this event to include a link to the slides in the recording. And so with that, let's get going talking about hospital community benefit. Uh, one of the things that you might be interested in knowing is why we're looking at this issue right now. Uh, one of the things that we have discovered is that people aren't generally aware of hospital community benefit funds or how they work or what hospitals' interests in using them. And all of these kinds of questions remain, but really when we're looking at hospitals, homeless health care providers, we're natural partners. We're many times serving the same vulnerable population. Um, the hospitals in particular are under increasing pressure to reduce hospital use, uh, readmission rates, uh, utilization and cost overall, and this is both in the emergency room and in the hospital inpatient setting. And so as community providers, we're also taking a look at a very changing landscape um, for us uh, and what resources are available, particularly in non-expansion states uh, under the Medicaid benefit. So in looking at states in particular that don't have those additional resources, we're all really looking at how we can maximize our community resources to meet the needs of the people that we're serving. So knowing more about hospital community benefit is really going to position us much more strongly to know what those partnerships can look like. How can we leverage those resources? Uh, so in approaching hospitals and thinking about what resources are needed, uh, this webinar will really help uh, present you some information that can help us get started in really making sure we can maximize that. And so I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we'll start with Eli Simmons, who was an intern with us at the Council as he was doing his Master's in Business Administration at Vanderbilt University. Did a lot of the research and analysis behind the policy brief that supports this. If you do not have the policy brief, it should have been um, linked in the announcement for this webinar, but we can also provide that as well in the follow-up email. Uh, Eli will talk through some of the basic components of the hospital community benefit. And then we'll talk to Carrie Harnish, who is the Clinical Director for Community Benefit at Trinity Health. Carrie will give us a perspective from the hospital's point of view on what they're looking for and how they would appreciate community providers reaching out to them in those partnerships. And then two people from the Healthcare for the Homeless Community, Brooks Ann McKinney, Director of Vulnerable Populations at Mission Health Center down in Nash Asheville, North Carolina, a non-Medicaid expansion state can really talk through what this looks like for her, particularly in a more rural area. And then Doreen Fadis is Executive Director of Community Benefit and Health at Mercy Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, a state that is actually a Medicaid expansion state. In fact, they've had Medicaid expansion for quite a while now and can really speak to how these resources can complement Medicaid and other resources uh, in, in a state like Massachusetts. So at this point, I am going to pass it over to Eli, who can talk to us a little bit more. So take it away, Eli. All right. Thanks, Barbara. So we wanted to begin with a brief overview of the hospital community benefit requirements and the way they've evolved over time. Um, as many of you might know, community benefit is driven by the IRS through the tax code. And in order to justify nonprofit status um, and qualify for tax exemptions, not-for-profit hospitals are required by the federal government as well as state governments uh, to engage in activities that benefit their local communities. 
Um, so there have been a number of phase changes in the requirements since its inception in the 1950s, but among those, um, really one of the most pivotal moments and changes uh, came with the Schedule H development and its implementation. Um, and this is a special tax form where hospitals report their HCB activities. Um, and a major reason why this is a particularly important change for HCB, because um, it really helps standardize the definition of community benefit as well as its scope. Um, and what it did is it provided a number of specific categories or services that can be performed to satisfy the community benefit requirements. Um, and with that additional level of structure, uh, this in turn helps streamline the reporting process across all nonprofit hospitals. Um, and most importantly, it really just helped uh, remove a lot of the former uncertainty around ways to not only demonstrate um, these community benefit contributions, but also for hospitals just to generally understand uh, which services can in fact be supported to meet those community benefit requirements. Um, and then in addition to Schedule H, uh, some of the other largest changes came with the Affordable Care Act, which introduced four key provisions that really just led to more of a substantive and consistent policy across states and hospital organizations. Um, and again, along with Schedule H, these four provisions are required uh, to qualify for tax exemption. Um, and among these four provisions, we find that really the most impactful is the community health needs assessment. And this assessment is required to be conducted every three years. And in addition to the assessment, hospitals are also required to develop an implementation plan or strategy that is really designed to just help ensure there's a clear map to um, addressing those identified needs. Um, and an, an, an additional aspect that's also really great is that um, from the community standpoint is that it serves as a great way for these hospitals to actually take into account input from various organizations throughout the community um, that actually might represent a number of different interests. Um, and it also allows really these organizations to be a part of the, the entire process as opposed to just being the recipients um, at the end of the process by, taking, by really participating in the decision-making process and being able to kind of um, have that conversation with those hospitals. So the remaining three components or the main, remaining three provisions, uh, financial assistance policy, limit hospital charges, and extraordinary collection actions are also uh, very meaningful provisions. And what these essentially do is serve as safeguards to ensure uh, that patients in need of financial assistance are appropriately accounted for by the hospital. So the next slide is really just designed um, to kind of highlight the progression and the overall evolution of the hospital community benefit definition and its scope. Um, and as you can see here in its inception in 1956, the language that was used to kind of describe uh, the de or really just to define the overall policy um, was used with very vague language. And, and for an example, um, it even, hospitals are even asked to engage in community benefit activities that are really just, are really engaged in these activities to the best of the hospital's financial ability. Um, and as you can see, that, that, that type of language really doesn't provide much guidance um, or structure around meaningful ways to really contribute to the community. Um, and as a result of that, that sometimes led to poor use of community benefit resources. Um, but as you can see with this visual, over time, especially with the implementation of Schedule H and, and the provision, or the four provisions listed in the ACA, as I just mentioned, um, hospitals are really now better positioned to put their community benefit resources to good use. Um, and in addition to that, they can do it with a much higher degree of confidence. So now to the two different types of uh, community benefits, the first being community benefit, or part one, and the second group is called community building activities, or part two. Um, and what's, um, as, as you can see here, is that there are a lot of uh, allowable items under community benefit, as well as community building activities, um, and they do also cover a pretty wide range of activities and services. Um, and, uh, and really, just a major distinction to make here is that on the left side under community benefit, uh, these are required services while the community building activities or part two are only optional. Um, and what that means is that in order to qualify for tax exempt status, um, not-for-profit hospitals are required to either support or provide at least one of these benefits um, in order to earn that tax exempt status. 
Um, and if you look on the other hand with the optional uh, services, these of course are also very important, meaningful ways to contribute to local communities. Um, however, it is important to understand that by um, if hostels were to only support these services on the right-hand side um, without any existing support for the required services, that of course would not be enough to suffice for that tax-exempt status. Um, so for the HCH folks looking to engage um, with these hospitals and have those conversations around community benefit, um, it's important to kind of anticipate that hospitals should be more inclined um, to agree to any requests um, around services that are required since they will understand that by doing so um, will allow them to earn that tax-exempt status. Um, and then really just the major uh, final piece to address here um, is that housing previously was only listed under physical improvements, which as you can see on the top right is an optional um, community building activity. But just recently, due to a lot of advocacy efforts, um, housing is also now included under community health improvement, which is great because that's a required part one benefit. And the implication behind that is that since it is a required benefit, it's fair to expect that going forward, hospitals should be more willing uh, to support those requests around housing support. And now to look at the overall distribution of community benefit spending. As you can see here, uh, the three largest categories or contributions are unreimbursed costs for means-tested government programs such as Medicaid or Medicare, uh, charity care, which directly relates to financial assistance, which um, is also a uh, part one required community benefit, and then lastly, subsidized health services, which is also part one, um, and is really just clinical services provided despite a financial loss to the organization. Um, and what's interesting here is that uh, these three costs, or these top three categories, um, really serve as a means for hospitals to kind of reimburse themselves, um, because these three categories really just represent a form of loss that the hospitals um, continually experience. Um, so that kind of helps explain why these categories have turned out to be uh, the largest. And um, in addition to that, it also might help us understand um, why hospitals in turn may have historically been slightly reluctant to invest in other categories such as community health improvement. Um, but as our healthcare system continues to evolve, especially following the enactment of the ACA, uh, we do think that HH organizations will begin to also see these proportions shift um, especially in the category of community health improvement. So now to um, our next slide, as there are uh, several key components of the Affordable Care Act that we anticipate will continue to help shift the way hospitals contribute to community benefit, and those two are Medicaid expansion and then our general health care system's transition from fee-for-service care to value-based care. Um, and then looking on the left side, uh, this box doesn't really apply to the non-expansion states, of course, um, but among those who do operate in expansion states, um, it is important to understand that hospitals will continue to experience increased costs to cover their rise in Medicaid shortfalls um, as a result of, of course, having a larger Medicaid population. Um, but by having a higher or ha having a larger Medicaid population, uh, that in turn, of course, will also reduce the uninsured rate that they experience among their patient population, um, which will reduce their charity care expenditures um, for those that are uninsured. Um, so that, we believe, will help create some future investments and in, in opportunities uh, for other community benefit categories, uh, such as community health improvement. And then looking at value-based care, um, hospitals are, are really increasingly being incentivized uh, to focus on quality improvement and, and really um, increasing their overall quality of care while also reducing um, unnecessary costs. And a way that they are being incentivized to do that is by reducing the length of stay and as well as readmissions among their patient population. Um, and a lot of hospitals are finding that a successful way to achieve that objective is by focusing on social determinants of health as well as other community factors that might cause poor health and high hospital utilization rates. Um, so overall, we anticipate that this will help influence hospital decision making around those community benefit contributions. Um, and just another way to look at it, just thinking about the distribution slide, is that um, 
as a result of these types of changes, especially with the Affordable Care Act, some pieces of the pie will get smaller, especially charity care, and that in turn will allow other categories, such as community health improvement, um, to receive additional community benefit funding, and it will really help grow their piece of the pie. Um, so that is our general overview of hospital community benefit and also where we expect it to go going forward. And now I'll turn it over to Carrie to discuss hospital perspectives on community benefit. Thanks, Eli. So I'm Carrie Harnish. I'm Clinical Director of Community Benefit here at Trinity Health. Just a quick uh, background, Trinity Health is one of the largest Catholic healthcare systems in the country. We have 92 hospitals and a very large continuum of care with over 30 million people in our communities. And our mission drives our vision and strategy, and transforming our communities is directly in our mission statement. Similar to what Eli was talking about earlier, nonprofit hospitals are under a tremendous budget pressures and are navigating numerous changes in the healthcare environment. And as we move from a volume-based world to a value-based world, our previous way of doing business is completely changing, and we need to recognize the importance of treating the whole person, including those social determinants of health that traditionally we didn't influence, such as the truth that housing is health care. But while social determinants of health are gain gaining more traction, it will take time to embed these concepts into a health care culture that is still focused on providing acute care. So here at Trinity Health, our strategy is that we will build a people-centered health system together. We will know that we are people-centered when we put the people we serve at the center of every behavior, action, and decision in our ministry. As you can see from our slide, we view our responsibilities in three areas. The first one is episodic health care for our patients. How are we caring for our patients today in the moment? The second one is population health management. How are we caring for the long-term need of those who have chosen us to provide their ongoing care? And how are we preve preventing illness? How are we effectively managing all aspects of care? And then that third pillar is community health and well-being. How are we addressing the social determinants of health in our communities and addressing the basic causes of illness? And really, how are we providing care to those who are most vulnerable? And our work around healthcare for the homeless fall into all three of those pillars. We have some examples here at Trinity Health around community benefit investment into um, healthcare for the homeless. We have two FQHCs that are directly a part of our system and one that we manage for the local health department. We have street medicine teams and mobile units. We provide su financial support for community-based medical respite programs. And we're currently developing a new scorecard for our hospitals to measure their services to persons without homes. It will measure screening for all patients for housing instability and documenting in the electronic medical record. It will measure how we provide or support outpatient services for help for homeless folks, how we collaborate with internal or external pro partners to coordinate care, how we develop, share, and analyze data on population health, how we identify and address insufficiencies and gaps in care, how we participate in provider networks that serve the homeless population, and how we are working to remedy adverse social determinants of health. And finally, how are we document or directing community benefit funds to benefit those without homes or at risk of homelessness? So from my view at the 10,000-foot perspective, I have the following advice. As identified earlier, all nonprofit hospitals are required to complete community health needs assessments with an associated implementation plan every three years. Read your local hospital's current CHNA, figure out when the next one is, and get around the table for the planning and the implementation of the next one. Make sure you have your participants share their input on their priorities when the hospital is seeking feedback. And if you're a part of a community coalition, make sure they're at the table too. Hospitals are often very siloed and could use your help to create awareness of the other services around them and the impact your services have on your consumers' overall health and well-being. And each stakeholder group offers a unique perspective. You have providers and practitioners who implement your programs, your behavioral health and substance abuse counselors, senior decision makers at the hospitals have a totally different perspective, referring organizations, clinicals, and hospitals have a dis different perspective, the homeless population, and even public health and local government 
all see things in, in different uh, lenses. Build ongoing relationships and learn the languages of healthcare, hospitals. Simply the term population health has multiple different definitions. Understand their priorities. Here at the hospitals, we have reducing readmissions, addressing chronic conditions, a fo focus on social determinants, and the triple aim, better care, lower cost, greater patient satisfaction. We could really use your help to share your research. What's the size of your community's homeless population? What's the number of homeless in need of respite care? The medical problems requiring respite care? Gender, age, ethnicity, family status, type of homelessness? Is it episodic, chronic, temporary? The origin of your respite care needs? Is it hospitals, shelters, homeless clinics? Other available community resources? And information on gaps in services, the impact of your programs, et cetera, can go a long way to help with a community health needs assessment and to make the business case for the hospital to partner with you. And illustrate the connections. Really paint the picture and help them connect the dots. So you finally get a seat at the table. This is the time for perfect opportunity to align the work you're doing with your local hospitals. When you're ready to approach the hospital, prepare your talking points. Make the case. How does your program impact care, cost, readmission rates, et cetera? Whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit hospital, everyone is really concerned about cost and quality. If you can demonstrate how your program can save money, provide better care, and impact risk, they're more likely to listen to you. And have a clear ask. What would an ideal partnership look like to you? What do you need from them? And be patient and persistent. Healthcare didn't get this way overnight, and we're not going to fix it overnight either. And stay at the table and be open-minded and creative. We are charting new territory, but we're still dealing with old rules. Be creative to meet everyone's needs, the clinicians, the attorneys, the administrators, and the consumers. Keep at it. There definitely is a solution out there. And with solutions, we've got Brooks Ann right after me. Thanks, Gary. Hi, I'm Brooks Ann McKinney. I'm from Mission Health System in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we are in a non-expansion state, and that's just important to notice through my presentation. So the western region of North Carolina has just, over the years, really um, has gone through a, a very hard time, especially with the people in poverty. Um, the western region has a poverty rate that has been higher than the state and national levels for over 10 years. Um, and, and as you see in the quote up there, that is getting worse. Um, but also, we're just really dealing with uh, emergency rooms being filled with mentally ill patients that um, cannot get care, but also just the poorest. And um, everyone knows that under the Affordable Health Care Act, this was a, um, an issue that the 200% below poverty level uh, do not get the benefits, especially the 100% below, which are homeless. And so we're really having to deal with the issues, especially in our emergency rooms. So with community investment, formerly known as community benefit, uh, the community and health needs assessment that uh, has been already spoken about um, serves the region of 22 counties. And historically, community investment was a competitive annual grant program given to projects that focused on the needs of the region. But for 2017, the most recent priorities chosen around the region, community investment grant funding for fiscal year 2017 was um, to support three focus areas, healthy living and food security, behavioral health and substance abuse, and interpersonal violence and adverse childhood experiences. So as Mission Health has grown um, from a local hospital to a regional health system, now we do actually have six hospitals um, and multiple uh, providers, especially specialty clinics. So community investment is shifting to focus on the broadest impact with the greatest potential to address health priorities and reduce disparities. So funding preference will be given to initiatives rather than individual programs and measurable work achieved through purposeful collaboration. So Mission Health uh, will continue to support the work of organizations and agencies by eliminating disparities and providing services to the vulnerable members of the community but also the critical work improves prevention, reduces hospital stays, and respects the dignity of residents who need the most support. So this is really where the programs that serve the homeless population can meet the needs of the uh, CHNA priorities. 
and also with proving the return on investment um, is taken into consideration for funding because when you look at hospital readmissions length of stay, that's really what the hospitals are looking at. And Carrie just um, explained that very well when she was talking about population health. So due to the disparities that the homeless population face, many other priorities are parallel to these disparities. So gathering data and the cost with the highest utilizers um, that are homeless can lead to advocacy for HCH programs or other programs to be funded. So some examples of community investment funding since 2012. Um, one was the Homeless Outreach Team, which is a clinical team that focused on outreach to the highest utilizers from the emergency room. And we actually had two FTEs that were uh, clinical in nature where they would come um, from a referral within that was an embedded case manager in the emergency room that would uh, make the referral out to the homeless outreach team and they would come there but also they would coordinate care with multiple agencies and we saw great success with that especially with the highest utilizers. Um, one of the highest utilizers um, was a female that got into housing um, and she had years and years of being on the street and ever since she did have the homeless outreach team engage her, she is now in housing and has not been back to the emergency room once. Um, also, Homeward Bound of Western North Carolina, uh, they did past funding, but also presently they get funding. They're the largest nonprofit that receives the CSC funding to manage all housing vouchers and case management for PSH and scattered site projects. Uh, and the, recently they funded two case manager positions. Other examples, um, new me medical respite program that uh, has been up and running almost two years. It has eight beds for homeless discharge from the inpatient beds. There's funding for operational support and also support for one-time renovation of buildings for HCH, FQHC, that the hub is downtown Asheville and then outreach sites are in local emergency shelters and supportive housing sites. So that's in collaboration with HUD and COC. And you can really start to see how the hospital is becoming part of that continuum of care. Um, to get other details, you can go to missionhealth.org at community investment uh, and really see the, the details of numbers, but also other projects that are funded. So suggestions for building relationships with hospitals, just coming from outside the hospital world, but now being in that now, um, it's really important to find a champion that can help with ways to analyze patient uh, visits pre and post intervention and when I say that is is really finding someone that has access to, to some of that information not even when it comes to cost but when it just comes to number of visits because that's really what's critical um, in this world of population health and uh, reducing readmissions. Another idea is to start a FUSE frequent user system engagement group which under the Corporation for Supportive Housing um, or csh.org, you could get a lot more details about that, but that's really a way that you can have a high utilizer meeting um, looking at the frequent patients uh, in the hospital, but also you can do that in your local jail or as a community high utilizer group. And out of that, you can really start collecting data. Um, Collecting data with the patients that you serve who are high utilizers and find ways to show how your program reduces readmissions or costs to the system. So if you do have a stakeholder group that gets together and can discuss these things, then over time you'll be able to show the patients that may be in your program or in your clinic that their reduction of readmissions is a cost avoidance for the hospital. So it's just important to start tallying those, those patients. So ways for hospitals to collaborate and advocate internally. Uh, at triage, when entering the emergency department, there's ways to work with IT to create a high utilizer flag. Um, not necessarily that's going to track the homeless population, but it'll start showing the highest utilizers and starting to do uh, intervention at the beginning. Um, working with case management and IT to develop a homeless indicator that can be sent to tally numbers, need of services, et cetera. Um, it's very difficult when you're looking at hospital systems and, and data systems due to sometimes there may be six or seven different EMRs or 
different ways to analyze data. So it's really important to find the most unified data system that you do have in the hospital. But if you can get an indicator or something that can go through the EMR to show the numbers, then you can really start proving why the most chronically ill that are homeless really need housing. So get physicians and clinicians trained to use the ICD-10 code for homelessness. ICD-10 code is already there. It's just a matter of really getting support within the hospital or uh, the CMO to, to make sure that there's training to use that code. Once they get that code, I think that's when you can really do the, the trainings for SOAR and other ways to coordinate care in the community. Also, if there's a community liaison that attends the COC, HUD, county, FQHC meetings to build relationships and bring organizations into the hospital, then it will serve the patients before discharge. And this is where the SOAR workers, the ASPIDAT certified um, staff that may come from a local COC or past teams, if, if the case managers in the hospital could work with those um, organizations, they can call them, get them to come in bedside, and you guys can work together on a plan. And really that advocacy within the hospital and the social workers and the nurses working together and the doctors seeing that is how there, there can be uh, a growth in the awareness, but then that also allows advocacy for housing because everyone is under the same pressure. So if you could all get on that same team and work together, you could, you could really move um, and change the way that the hospital looks at, uh, at discharge and knowing that the lack of affordable housing and respite beds, that is the way to go because then they know that there will not be a readmission in the next 72 hours. And now I would like to pass it to Doreen. Thank you, Brooke Sand. Um, I'm Doreen Fadis, and I'm Vice President of Mission and Community Health for the Sisters of Providence Health System in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. So just to put uh, in perspective the relationship that we all have on the phone today, uh, Carrie talked about Trinity Health and 92 hospitals. So I am one of the 92 hospitals that is within the Trinity Health System. And the slide that she had put on talking about the three areas of people-centered care of Trinity Health was the uh, clinical, uh, the episodic care, uh, the population management care, and then the third bucket was looking at community health and well-being. So Trinity then takes that community health well-being and breaks it down into three areas looking at the safety net, which is indicative of many of the programs that you all represent. The first one is clinical services, and that's looking at the transformation, the safety net care, uh, working in um, uh, safety net clinics, uh, working with duly enrolled population. The next one is community engagement, and these are the things that many times people think about in terms of community benefit, which is being out in the community, whether it's a health fair or uh, hands-on work. But the third bucket, which is really very unique, and at the end I'll spend a little bit of time talking about it, is community transformation, is truly moving the needle on the health of the community and the hospitals taking responsibility for doing that. So I would like to give you a a uh, few examples of some of the things that our hospital has been working on under community benefit. Some of these are very long-standing programs that have uh, gone through the test of times of being evaluated and monitored that they still fall um, under the community health and community benefit model, and some of them are newer efforts. So one is the Vietnamese Health Project. This is a totally hospital-funded program in which uh, two case managers work with the Vietnamese population. Um, they service about six to 700 Vietnamese in this community, uh, multi-generational, everything from uh, children to moms, the grandparents, the dad, uh, working on uh, prenatal care, postnatal um, benefits, and case management and translation. But it's been a wonderful uh, contribution to the community and one that we continue to see the need for in our community. The high-end utilizer program is a more modern and a 
just um, a newer program in our system. We took a look at the uh, high-end utilizers that were coming into the emergency room. Just to put it a little bit in perspective, we have had health care reform in Massachusetts since 2006, and we have more than seen our emergency room usage doubled. As a matter of fact, I think our hospital is one of the third largest in the state for volume. And um, we are 90 miles west of Boston, and many times people think of Boston as the mecca of, uh, of health care, and it, and it is, but there are more options in terms of emergency rooms for people in Boston, and hence sometimes the uh, very large and overcrowding in our emergency rooms. Because of many people having insurance, they're much more comfortable in coming to the emergency room now, and we um, looked at our high-end utilizers um, and had a reduction in ED usage and hospitalization over 50% by supporting uh, case managers in the healthcare system. And that too was part of our community benefit contribution. The Faith Community Nursing Program uh, is um, an RN run program in which the nurses work with uh, nurses in any faith community, synagogue, um, working on the community's definition of what health is to them. It could be as simple as a, a walking club. It could be um, conducting health fairs. It could be uh, cooking classes within the church. But getting the, the synagogues, the church, the faith communities to define what um, their needs are in terms of in, improving health and, and moving things along. The VAN Ministry is an example of um, a very new program, and we kind of did this backwards, to be quite honest. We were given a van and received some money to uh, wrap the van and, and really decorate it nicely, as you can see, and um, just started bringing it out to the community, to various areas. It is very popular. It's um, only 28 feet long. So it's not one of those that needs to be driven by a, a CDL licensed person. And we um, go to farmers markets. We've done uh, first aid at road races or events. We've brought them to schools so um, kids can walk through and meet a health care provider. Uh, down the bottom left is the gentleman who is running the van program, and he's taking care of the dogs while someone's inside having their blood pressure taken. But it's been very, very popular. And, you know, now we've got the van, we're doing things, and now we need to um, work with the hospital and also um, have the hospital support either the driver. Getting people out in the community is not a problem. We always have nurses, doctors that want to volunteer to do things. It's just the, the operations of it, the insurance, the van, and things like that, and that will be a community, be community benefit contribution as we go forward. Just to give you an idea of some of the events that have gone on in the van ministry, as I mentioned, uh, a jazz festival, farmer's market, uh, working with the veterans, high school students, uh, health fairs, uh, churches, um, and it was even at the, wor uh, the world's largest pancake breakfast, which is held here in Springfield, Mass. But mostly, too, as you can see, some of the partners that we have worked with, and I should probably point out this van has only been on the road for less than eight months and um, it's very much in demand and again as I said we're working out a, a plan on how we can support it even um, more within our system. Healthcare for the Homeless uh, is a program that um, we've had in our system since 1983 and in 1988 we partnered with the City of Springfield and another nonprofit and Yearly Mercy's Healthcare for the Homeless program works with 2,300 homeless individuals and 13,000 encounters. And um, although that is sponsored in part by the 330 grants, uh, the hospital also puts in about a quarter million in in-kind funding to that program in the form of uh, administration, space costs, and services, and, and things like that. So um, it's it's a um, very interesting example of a program that falls into the mission of a faith-based system, and um, it's certainly not going to um, 
be determined by community health needs assessment because it is an area that has been in such demand in our community since 1983. This is just a small example of some of the boards and committee that just the community health department uh, works on with um, within the community, and this is not representative of the whole hospital. So part of as much as um, Brooksanne and Eli and Carrie all talked about you as a participant finding out who to speak to in the hospital and develop relations, it's up to us as a healthcare system to have those relationships in the community as well. So this just represents one department in the hospital and some of the um, groups that they participate on. I want to take a moment to talk about the Transforming Community Initiative. This is an initiative under um, the Trinity Health System, which is what Carrie represents. And Trinity Health gave out um, six Trinity Grant Awards for Transform Transforming Communities Initiative Grant. And this falls under the bucket that I mentioned early of truly trying to transform the community. Our partners for the Transforming Community Grant are Partners for a Healthy Community, HAP Housing, Martin Luther King Jr. Family Services, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Square One, and Springfield Food Policy Council. We have been given by Trinity a half a million dollars a year over a five-year period to work with the social determinants, especially in the areas, as you can see, health disparities, childhood obesity, smoking-related diseases, and to have a, a build a safer environment, exercise program, tobacco policy, and so on. This partnership was um, put together um, through an existing program in Springfield called Live Well Springfield, in which it was basically a media campaign taking area um, participants and having signs all around Springfield in terms of um, eating well, representing various communities, getting physical activities, whether it's rowing, biking, working on the bike path in the city. So when the Trinity grant opportunity came about, we were able to reach out to these partners who fell under Live Well Springfield and ask them if they wanted to participate in this grant opportunity. And um, the response, response was great, and we ended up with the six partners. Also, as um, part of the Trinity grant, there is a flexible capital loan fund, um, which will be developed. And in applying for the grant, we had to talk about some capital needs within our community. These will be low interest loans that are available to our community partners. And these are just a couple examples of some of the things that we wrote about. Some of them are very. Um, sophisticated and ahead of the curve and, and moving along, such as the Wellspring is an urban greenhouse model that will employ 9 to 12 uh, low-income residents to work on supplying food and mobile markets around the city. Um, and the rolling greenhouse is an idea of a small retrofitted van to have a mobile garden for in the community. The last item, the public school prep kitchen, is to look at physical improvements to um, processing fresh fruits and vegetables from our community. We're uh, in a very rich farming community just north of Springfield. And unfortunately, our school system is not able to take advantage of that because there is no processing plant for the contractor. And the last project, which is a uh, very large one, is uh, Mercy is working with the Mason Square Health Task Force to look at bringing a grocery store into an area that is an, it's a food desert. It's highly in need of um, services. Uh, there's no fresh fruits and vegetables. It's primarily uh, fast food, bodegas, and uh, liquor stores. So the goal is to bring in a supermarket that will all actually be a community project as well. And lastly, just before we break into some questions, is just to talk about how a hospital can think outside of the hospital walls. The DISTI project is um, we are a disproportionate share hospital in that we serve a large number of Medicaid patients. We are one of the seven hospitals in the 
um, state to do that. So we get funds to uh, look at how we can um, provide more uh, efficient um, avenues of care in our system. We're also a partner in the Build Health Grant, which is similar to the Transforming Community Grant, which is looking at social determinants in a particular neighborhood in Springfield. We're looking at a CMS grant, the case management models. Um, Trinity Health also has a AmeriCorps granting opportunity with 50 AmeriCorps members being spread out among the 92 hospitals. And just in general, volunteering in, in the community, um, I really view my job as uh, getting the hospital outside of the walls. And um, just to follow up on some of the suggestions both Brooks Ann and Carrie made is to, as you're reaching out to the healthcare systems, make sure you read their community health needs assessment. It's on their website. It should be um, two clicks away from the website, and people should um, understand that. You should be able to find it very easily. Read the CHIP, the implementation plan, exactly what the hospital plans to do in that year. And build relationships. Um, sometimes it's not always about just asking for money. It's about asking for relationships. An example I can give of that is um, in terms of our marketing department that provides sponsorship uh, for the community. Many times people are asking for money for golf tournaments or dinners and things like that. And we've really scripted a letter saying, you know, thank you for your interest, but we are putting our efforts into areas that fall under our community health uh, needs assessment, which might include mental health, substance abuse services, homeless services, and things like that. So it's really changed the whole mindset here in terms of sponsorship and how we proceed. So lastly, find the right person. You don't know where that person will be. They could be in marketing. They could be in a community health department, a community benefit. But find the right person just to start the relationship with about talking about community benefit. And on that note, I'll close, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. That was really great information. Um, want to get to a couple of questions that have come in while uh, you were talking. So one thing is, uh, let's be really clear that hospital community benefits is for nonprofit hospitals, and that's a way that they justify to the IRS their tax-exempt status. But I just want to clarify, what does this mean uh, for for-profit hospitals? And I guess, Carrie, I'll, I'll put that question to you. Hi, thanks, Barbara. So really what I understand for profit the hospitals to be, and, and granted I come from a, a nonprofit hospital world, is, is that they're not required to provide community benefit, but they do do some community benefit just as being members of the community and, and doing things you know, similar to other for profit businesses do. Excellent. Okay. And then I'm curious, um, so one of the things that uh, a question that came in, Doreen, while you were talking about your loan, your flexible loan program, is there a repayment obligation for that, as the loan would imply? Yes, it would be a, a loan interest. Um, and that is something that's being developed in Trinity, so I, I really don't have a lot of details. But it would be through uh, CD, CDFI. Um, yeah, yeah, CDFI, and it would be between Trinity and the neighborhood participant and then the Community Development Loan Fund. Got it. So I'm curious, too, because there's two different scenarios that play out in both North Carolina and other non-Medicaid expansion states. And then in states like Massachusetts in particular, Doreen, you've had Medicaid expansion for much longer than the rest of the country, or at least the states have expanded. So I'm really interested in how, uh, and we'll, let's start with you, Brooksanne, in a non-Medicaid expansion state. What are some of the pressures, you know, how does the lack of Medicaid expansion really impact the ability to do some of this flexibility or innovation? Uh, just tell me a little more about the pressures that you feel like your hospital's under. Well, because of the lack of reimbursement for the 100% below, that means that charity care uh, for nonprofit hospitals are having to to really um, be on overdrive, uh, unlike before. And so the state is barely getting reimbursed. I mean, I think the last numbers uh, were that we were losing $4 million a day in our state just by not taking um, 
the expansion, uh, I guess, at that time. But now, with the pressures on the hospitals to taking these people, especially in the emergency room, um, some hospitals are barely making it um, because of that. So we just have issues of getting basic primary care, behavioral health care, and services to the region, uh, unlike the other states that have had reimbursement now um, for over uh, two years. And so they can show that they can work on housing and more innovative practices. But we are still trying to just meet the needs of the most vulnerable. Thank you. And then, Doreen, your thoughts about how Medicaid expansion has impacted hospitals' flexibility or their interest in innovation or something like that? Um, I, you know, I think that the thought going forward is that um, as more people are insured, there's going to be less hospital commitment under uh, charity care and Medicaid reimbursement rates and that more programming will happen. I have to be honest, I haven't seen that on a great level in this area that we've had to, we, we certainly have increased our, pro, our programming. We certainly have increased our mindset, which I think is very, very important. But our charity care and our um, differential with Medicaid rates still has remained high. So I don't think that has happened, at least in my experience, as quickly as maybe people thought it would. Okay. Does that um, and, yeah, and, and I think, too, maybe different areas are in different places, but that's telling, again, in Massachusetts, very progressive state, lots of resources, just to kind of get a sense of what those influences are. Well, we had a question come in, and this is in response to discussion about how do you justify return on investment uh, and those concepts for hospitals that are looking to make the investments that we had talked about along the way in terms of meeting goals for cost, fulfilling community need. Um, specifically, I guess, and, and Carrie, maybe I'll start with you, but, but please um, jump in, uh, Eli or, or Doreen or, or Roxanne. What kinds of data uh, can community providers like HCHs provide, or how do you demonstrate return on investment? Sometimes those numbers aren't always available. Yeah, the, and they're definitely not always available to the hospital systems either. This is definitely a new arena that we're not familiar with um, when you try and, and blend the, the medical models and, and the social models and be able to show, you know, how much would you get if you prevented a readmission. And so we're, we're all still um, working through that and, and how that works. And we've actually um, funded the um, National um, Council to do a little bit of research around that to um, really identify how many folks are homeless in a, a couple of our hospitals and um, what, what do they, you know, what kind of services are they getting along the way and then if we layered on a model of this one specific to medical respite, what could that potentially save us? And so um, even though they might not be our current patients or they're somebody else's patients, you can hypothetically say, okay, instead of based on my medical respite program and I know that you know, Bob has not returned to the hospital in six months when the prior six months he was there every other day, you can kind of do a, a few assumptions and be able to predict some of that out. And we're not going to be able to do exact numbers until we figure some of these other things out. So just coming to the hospitals with saying, look, in our experience, talking to Bob, we know that Bob was in your hospital, you know, every other day. And now that he has been in our medical respite facility or now that we've been caring for him, um, he hasn't been back in six months. So working with the hospital folks to be able to do some of those calculations too on their side, um, it's really partnerships and it's really talking to each other and sharing what we do know on, on our sides to be able to work out some of those models. Yeah, and Barbara, um, I could speak to that uh, because we have shown that if you do work with a hospital and, you know, after you have HIPAA in place and all the the protected, um, uh, uh, I guess I would say return on investment, but not, I think the protected forms that they sign when they come in uh, to the emergency room, HIPAA covers a lot of that. And when 
programs work with the hospital, especially medical respite programs. Um, there's ways to get the patient data uh, so you can look at um, cost over time. And just remember, there's a difference between actual costs and charges. And so if you get down that route, it may be more difficult. But if you could only show that prior to coming to respite and then after six months, that decrease will be that return on investment for the hospital. So if you do have someone in the hospital that could look up those those patients and look at pre and post, you can see a decrease in cost, and they can do that. It's just a matter of making sure that you protect the patient's rights, obviously, but also that you you show that the either six months or even a year before or a year after, if they go to respite or any other or HDH clinic, that the reduction is a cost savings for the hospital. So there are ways to do that. Any other um, comments to make on that? I think the data piece is really important, and I think that's where folks sometimes get um, stuck, is how do you demonstrate what you want to say is going to save money, or what you want to do will save money? Barbara, this is Dory, and I, I think sometimes, too, we have to take off our community health and our mission hat and join the, the return on investment language and be patient that we do need to um, show that there is a return on investment instead of just assuming that people should do this from the goodness of their heart. I mean, unfortunately, this day and age, we, we need to look at that as well. And so one thing I'm hearing you encourage is that you may not have it all figured out uh, at the community provider level, but maybe if you approach your hospital, you can work out some of the data together and then answer some of those questions along the way. Is that what you would recommend? Absolutely. Excellent. Um, Especially this, um, uh, Barbara, I'll say one, one other thing is, is one success story can go a long way. So when there is a, like the high utilizer I was um, speaking of, everyone knew her. And when she got in housing and no one saw her again, and then she came around and said she was doing well, that success story can really show a lot to the hospital. So I think just documenting those things as they happen and share that and say this is, this is what we really can do to help the community. I think that that really can go far. Got it. And then I think that opens up a question, and maybe this is a $64 million question for folks that are still hanging with us. We're almost at the hour. The role of using community benefit funding to pay for housing, and this is what everybody's interested in. Everybody's looking for housing money. Uh, the feds have been very clear that Medicaid dollars, federal Medicaid dollars, cannot be used to pay for housing. Uh, and there's been some work and some advocacy just in the last year to shift from that part one to a part excuse me, from part two to part one community benefit to include housing. Do we have any definitive information on how this works yet, or what would be your, your recommendation for pursuing the housing piece? And maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Carrie, might be the best person to answer. So we've been, um, you know, there, there are multiple different ways to count it, and really when you want to move it over into community benefit dollars is to be able to give more bang for the buck. Um, and really community benefit um, or the community health improvement aspect is more of, you know, the specific um, to the individual kind of things, like removing materials such as asbestos and lead that harm um, residents in public housing, providing, um, you know, filters for vacuum cleaners and that kind of thing to help uh, reduce asthma. Whereas more of the community building is, is more of the neighborhood improvement and, and efforts to, you know, reduce blight. But I, I find when I have these questions that I, I use the um, Catholic Health Association's website. They have a fantastic website called uh, chausa.org. And there's a what counts section on there. And if they don't answer it directly in the frequently asked questions, then they have a, a, a group that sits behind those frequently asked questions of experts that answer those questions. So if your answer is not in there, then um, definitely submit one to it. And they'll help you to determine really what's the difference between um, community health improvement and community building. Carrie, I would add, too, that the Catholic Health Association is very much of an advocate of sitting down with the IRS and pointing out why it needs to move from one side to the other, for sure. They have been advocating for that. 
And this is a good opportunity to point out our policy brief, which outlines a lot of the information we've covered today, includes links to that type of advocacy that they have done with the IRS. So very much appreciate that. Um, this, is a, this is, I think, a topic that we could talk about a lot more. We've got more questions that we weren't able to get to, but really want to appreciate everyone who came today to uh, talk with us about this. Uh, hospital community benefit funding, clearly an opportunity for homeless health care providers. Uh, just to let everybody know, yes, the PowerPoints will be available online. You will receive a link to them. The recording will also be available. You can share it with all your family and friends and your colleagues, um, but also especially your hospital partners and those that you might really use this as a way of uh, beginning discussions if you haven't yet. I um, also want to let you know that when we close this out, you'll get a survey to do an evaluation. Please let us know how this helped you better understand this issue, and let us know about other training that you would like to have in the future from the National Council. So I'd really like to thank all of my uh, presenters today. You guys really covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Appreciate your time and expertise. And uh, just encourage everyone to look for more webinar opportunities that will be coming your way this summer. Thank you again, and have a good day. Thank you.